quick review, we are in the last week of our Welcome to Church. Like there are certain things you need to know about every church when you show up. What is important to them? Uh, what do they value? And we've been going through this. And, and on week one, we discovered that obviously prayer and uh, the ministry of the word. Every church should value prayer and ministry of the word, which actually, this will come in handy later, is my job description. As the pastor, my job description is prayer and ministry of the word. Not setting up things, not singing, thankfully, because that helps you guys out a ton. Uh, not so many other things that I'm just not all that good at. Um, so we're going to try dialing in on what's going on with that. So prayer and ministry of the word. Then we started talking about uh, what the kingdom was. And the kingdom of heaven, and this really got a good understanding for a lot of people, because so often we talk about salvation, and we talk about heaven, and we forget that they both belong inside the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven starts the moment you put Jesus as the king of your life. It doesn't have boundaries. It doesn't have borders. It doesn't have space. It begins the moment the king begins kinging in your life. And you take him wherever you go and whatever you do. So we've been talking about how we valued uh, the kingdom, how we value relationships here at Catalyst. It seems like as you look all throughout Scripture, even in the Old Testament, it's paramount. They pass down from generation to generation, from, from Elijah to Elisha. We see so many relationships are important in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus set up a model for how we should do things, and it was all in relationships. It wasn't show up to a classroom. It wasn't, you know, let's light the stage well, let's give the guy a microphone, let's mess him up right before he talks, and then come up and let him share with everybody. It wasn't one of those things. He was like, we need to do life together. And through this, we're going to, we're going to study the word. We're going to figure out what it is to, to overcome hard times and, and, and to enjoy good times. And, and he just modeled that as we went last week, we looked about, um, understanding that God is moving things forward and God's job is to make sure that, that anything that any place that has chaos around us, that is slowing us down from following him and doing the, the job that he has given us to do, that he is taking care of that chaos. The finger of God comes and it drives out chaos. And for some of us, we have some chaos in our lives, right? We have some places in our hearts where Jesus is not yet the king of that part of our life. He is the king in quite a few other places. And hopefully as we mature spiritually, he moves into other places. But sometimes we like to cry, try on the crown ourselves in those areas of our lives, right? And we need, to, we need to push it back a little bit. So we've been talking about that. So this week, I wanted to continue to go on and talk about things that, that we value here at Catalyst that I think are foundational in Scripture. And I wanted to be able to talk about that. And as we understood um, prayer and, and the Word of God, as we understand relationships, as we understand kingdom, we understand God's job. This week I want to get in, and I want to make sure all of us leave and we understand uh, the roles that you have, the role that I have, so we're, we're all on the same page uh, moving forward. So, so we understand all of that. So in John chapter uh, 17, verse 3, it says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have set free. This is the goal, is that all people will know. And, and knowing here is not an intellectual knowledge. It is, I have spent enough time with you that I know how you will act. So through prayer, through reading the Bible, through studying, through worshiping together, through serving through using our gifts, the goal is that everyone would have an intimate relationship with Jesus. We talked about this last week. It's not about these spiritual activities that we do that get us further into the kingdom. It is about the presence of God. And the more often we are in the presence of God, the more likely we are to grow our faith and to know our role so that we can do uh, what God has created us to do. So as we look into the kingdom, 
uh, that is pretty clear in a few places. So I'm going to point out a few places. We're going to jump into a couple of scriptures. And then at the end, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're going to end. If you, want to, if you have your Bibles and you want to go there. But one of the places we always go, it's so easy. It's the, it's the uh, last thing that Jesus said. Like this is the commandment that he gave every one of us, right? Then Jesus came and said to them, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. I'm the boss. I get to say what happens now. I'm here in front of you. And then he says, therefore, go and make disciples, which if, you're, if you've spent any time in a church, we've said this here a ton. A better translation for that is as you go, as you go to work, as you go to your hobbies, as you go to your family, as you go with your children, as you go on the road, whatever you're doing, as you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So let me ask you a question. Who is going? You are. Boy. I like the idea of that. But, uh, who is supposed to be teaching? You are. Who is supposed to be baptizing? Who is supposed to be making disciples? Oh, it's not my job. You, we pay you, Scott. That's what you do. That's not. Prayer and ministry of the word is what I'm supposed to do. So we're going to talk about that as we go on a little bit more. But then, so God has said, okay, here's my expectation for all of you. As you're doing your life, just make sure that you put me on display. And as you put me on display, God's going to do the heavy lifting of giving you opportunities to share what he's doing in your life and, and opportunities to share maybe what you've learned. And, and then you can start getting to have these conversations about so what do you think about this Jesus thing? Where are you in this? And you get to have those conversations. You don't just kick open the door, but you take opportunities that God puts in front of you. And as God puts opportunities in front of you, he's given all of us these different gifts. And there's two different places that we see that God, that we see in scripture that Paul has listed gifts. And one of them is in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 4. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Now, 1 Corinthians 13 is is where everybody goes for their, um, okay, let's look at the spiritual gifts. But notice there's one word that keeps coming up more than any of the other ones. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 1, it says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal or tambourine. If you have the gift, uh-huh, we can all play this game. If you have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have the faith that can move mountains, but I do not have, I am nothing. I, if I give all of my possessions to the poor and give over my body to the hardship that I may boast, but I do not have, I gain nothing. Everybody wants to come to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and we want to argue and fight about gifts. Where Paul is trying to say, love. <laughs> Let's talk about prophecy. How about love? Let's talk about speaking in tongues. How about love? How about all wisdom and, and sharing every... How about love? Because if we get love right, it seems like the rest are going to come. So we see in another place, in Romans chapter 12, there's another list. And we'll run through this. We have different gifts according to the, uh, to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophecy, prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. It is to lead, do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. All these gifts. And then with a couple of them, he gives how you should do it, right? Not just that you should be doing it, but how you should be doing it. If you're going to give, uh, give generously. If you're going to lead, do it diligently, and some people sitting here today have these gifts. Some people sitting here today might have the gifts that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13. But here's the question is, do you believe when Paul wrote this, when he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, that this is the complete list? I don't think so. I think he's giving examples. I think when you, when you look at the rabbis and how they taught, I'd be willing to bet he was sitting in a crowd and was saying, when you have the gift of prophecy, like, you know, and when you have the gift of wisdom, you, he's pointing out people around him. And people are like, oh, he does have that gift. She does have that gift. Okay. 
So I think he was probably talking about and pointing out gifts that were in the room or in the, in the area that he was teaching. I don't think it was ever meant to be exhaustive. Because I know that, like, you don't have me leading worship on Sunday morning for a reason. I'm not gifted in that area. To be creative enough to write worship songs, to, to be creative enough, to be diligent enough, to work hard to be able to sing, sing to where you can lead, to be able to play an instrument as you sing, or be able to play an instrument as you're trying to lead other people to the throne room of God, that's a gift. I don't think there's any way around that. So I'm not limiting the scripture. I'm not limiting the Holy Spirit to these two lists of gifts and and that's all we have. But we've got to recognize there's a few other things going on. There are some expectations for us because here's the problem. As, As I review these gifts, the problem that we have is people have decided when they're going to use and where they're going to use and how they're going to use their gifts. But the problem is they're not your gifts. They're God's gifts. And they are there because they belong to all of us. But you're like, oh, these are my gifts. So I don't really like that person. I don't like that area. Uh, That's going to be hard. So I'm not going to use my gifts. It's like, well, that's pretty selfish, isn't it? And I'm not God, obviously, because some people will be smote uh, more than, uh, you know, let you hit the brakes in front of me on the way to, like, when I'm going somewhere, you smoke, we're gone. Next one. <laughs> Next one. But I'm wondering how long he allows you to keep these gifts if you are not using them for the reason that he gave them to you. Just a question. Something for you to think about. And as I review the, my job as a pastor, which is prayer and ministry of the word, so whose job is it to grow the kingdom? your job very easily this is your job anytime you are at this is your job i have a role in this also and i am also a part of the kingdom and i need to be using the gifts and talents that god has given me but in here i'm not the only person that's supposed to be growing the kingdom it's not just me and wes and and kathy and amy and holly no we set things up but if we, want, if we believe that the king sitting on the throne of our lives is the most important thing that we can give our life to, and I believe so passionately that other people need to have him ruling their life rather than them making the same mistakes over and over again, I have got to take the king to those places. It's not just my job. It's not like, well, it's God's job to grow the church. It's not. It is your job to grow the kingdom. We all just happen to be, God brought us together at this part of the kingdom. This isn't the entirety of the kingdom. There are other churches. There are other places. But we've got to understand this. And I want us to get this, and we're going to look in Ephesians chapter 4 today. Now, Ephesians is is one of those letters that is written from Paul to a church in Ephesus. And this church seems like it's just sort of a struggling church. Paul has had issues with them, and he's like, okay... What is the root of their issue? And as he starts figuring out, he's like, they're all immature Christians. They're all baby Christians. So they don't know what job they're supposed to have, who's supposed to play what role. What is the, what is the org chart in the church here in Ephesus? So Paul, in Romans and in 1 Corinthians, he's like, here are your gifts. In Ephesians, he's like, here's the org chart. If you want to make sure that the kingdom is growing, that you are doing your job in relationship to the church, the kingdom, husbands and wives, also with children, all of the above, you can find it here in Ephesians. But he starts in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. So it says, Christ himself gave uh, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people Four works of service. Let's stop there. To equip his people. So I I fit in one of these offices. I have this, this title, right? I have this expectation. My job is to equip you so that you can do the works of service. 
My job is not to do all the works of service. And then when we look at these, we see these, and here's some of the things that like get a little confusing as you go along. There are a couple different camps you can fall into. I'm still trying to figure out exactly where this is, but it says in verse 11, so Christ gave him, uh, himself gave the apostles. Okay, so we have apostles. When we read in Scripture, we understand who the apostles were. In Acts chapter 2, it says when they were replacing uh, Judas that they couldn't take anyone who wasn't there from the beginning of the ministry of Jesus until the end of the ministry of Jesus. And there were only two guys that were available, and they voted them in. Now, some people would say there are modern-day apostles. And if there are modern-day apostles, what they're saying is they're fulfilling the role that the apostles did also. They obviously can't be apostles. They weren't there at the beginning or end of Jesus' ministry. But what they're saying is, you're starting new things. You're starting new places in the kingdom. You're trying to take over a new area in the kingdom where there has never been this authority before. A lot of people would say these are church planters these days. They're starting new things. It's like, okay, both of those work. And then with the prophets, we see all over the Old Testament, sometimes even in the New Testament, we see prophets. Now, prophets so often, we like to think they're telling us the future. What they're doing is pointing to the word of God and saying, guys, we've got to get back to this. And so often, there's something going on in somebody's life, and they point it out in Scripture because God has given this, them the gift of prophecy. So we see this in the Old Testament, and if there are prophets still running around today, that's what they're doing. They're calling people back to the word of God. If the people are prophesying and say, here's what's going on to the future, Scripture also tells us what to do with that person. And if their prophecy doesn't get fulfilled, we throw rocks at them until they die. Doesn't seem like too many of those should be popping up. I'm just saying, like, I'm not a prophet. Let me skip that one. So then you have evangelists. Evangelists are sort of, they go to place to place to encourage the body, and then they leave. You bring them in, they speak, they might do a week here, they do two weeks here, and then they go on. They're not here to develop the system. They're not here to raise up disciples. They're, they're here to encourage the body, to light a fire, to bring a perspective, whatever it is, and then they're off to do it somewhere else. And then you have pastors and teachers. Pastor, the same word is used here for shepherd. It is someone who cares for the flock. Evangelist goes from place to place. They come in, they get everybody all fired up and say, bring your tambourines next week. And then the pastor shows up and everybody's shaking their tambourines. And he's like, we're going to have to deal with this. I don't even know what to... But the pastor is there and he's shepherding the flock. He's loving, he's caring for. But he's also, the pastor and the teacher go together here. My job is to educate you. My job is to equip you for service so that you can do the work of growing the kingdom. Now here's, here's one of those things, right? Like, I have messed this up. At the beginning, Holly and I were sent out to um, Idaho, and they taught us about how to plant a church. And there were sort of two different systems going on here. One was discipleship. One was this church growth strategy. But we didn't know that they were two separate things. We thought they fit together. So we tried doing both of them, and it didn't work really well at the beginning. And then we started realizing, oh, how about we do what Scripture has to say? And we've been pushing into that over the last few years and stuff, rather than church growth strategy. It's a good business strategy, and it can work, but you miss some things. You have these blind spots as you go along. So what we did at the beginning is I was doing everything. I remember people coming to me saying, Scott, what can we do? And I'm like, I don't know. Because I had no, I'd never started a church before. I had no idea what I could get them to do. I didn't know what their talents were. I didn't know what their skill sets were. I didn't know anything. I had no idea what they could do. I wanted them to help. I didn't know how to let them help. And I thought, if God called me to start this church, he wants me to do the work. So I set this example of, oh, I'll just work harder. I'll work more. And then I set the example for our staff. Let's just work harder. Let's just work more. And that's not at all what Scripture tells us to do. So because of that, there are some of you sitting here today who have gifts and talents that are not being used. And the reason is because we're trying to fill, fill in the cracks and crevices where we're not very good because I modeled that because I didn't know what I was doing early on. 
And because of that, we have these different deficiencies running around, right? So we're, we're trying to, to fix that out, and, and, and as we go along, we'll do that. So, um, so let's go, we'll just continue on here in Ephesians. Uh, let's start at verse 11 again. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service. I like these next, like here's what I have circled in mind. So that, so it gives us an order. If you do this, then this, so that the body of Christ may be built up. So if we want to build the body of Christ, if we want to build the kingdom of Christ, all of us have to be doing our jobs. And then when we do that, we are built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. So you can go ahead and quit using your talents, quit using your abilities when we all reach unity in our faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Let's go down to a Pentecostal church just down the road and see if we're, we're just a bit off. How about a real Southern Baptist church? We're just a bit off. Like The churches can't agree on unity we're missing out. So there's no, there's no place to even stop us yet. And if we sat down and we put all of our denominational stuff behind us, we agree on 99% of the same stuff. And we make arguments out of, you know, we make mountains out of molehills. It's just, it's ridiculous. So, so we can't be done yet because the churches, besides the people in the churches, we have not reached unity um, and knowledge in the Son of God. And become mature, attaining to the whole measure and the fullness of Christ. Mature. We think so often like when you become a Christian, you're either a Christian or you're not. And I agreed, but then we start talking about disciples, which is what we see in the New Testament so often. You have a disciple who is, who's this infant disciple, right? Just like your children. Like, Yes, like they need me for everything. They're making messes everywhere. They can't feed themselves. They're causing problems. They're whatever it is. So they need a parent to come help them out. And then you have these spiritual parents who are able to take people who are not quite there in their faith and to use their tools and their abilities, their time to love on them, to care for them, to, to get them to move along, to get them to put in a little effort so that they can mature in their faith. So the goal is they will become mature, attaining to the whole measure and fullness of Christ. Verse 14, then, I love these, like, Scott, just keep it simple. Do this in the order that I tell you. Then we will no longer be infants talk, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by the wind of teaching and the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speak truth and love. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. See, that's the thing. Like People give their life to Christ and then they hear you know, this, this preacher on TV or on YouTube or on Instagram and they're like, is what they're saying true? I don't know if what they're saying is true or not. Because they just don't know. No one has come along and helped them walk through these things. Well, is that what the preacher says or is that what Scripture says? Let's go back to what the Bible has to say, and then we can line it up. And here's where you can find it in the Bible. And here's a tool that'll help you find this topic in the Bible. It's, it's just helping people mature in their faith. And as we do that, we'll stop being confused all the time about this or that, or what am I supposed to do or not supposed to do? And you do this by speaking the truth in love, which is all kinds of fun, right? Because so often we're not good at this. We either want to bash you over her head or we don't want to say anything because it's uncomfortable. Yes, it is sometimes to say, I see you talking this way, but your evidence says something else. If we're doing discipleship and it's like, hey, we're going to read these seven chapters, we're going to show up on Tuesday, we're going to circle, we're going to highlight, we're going to underline, we're going to talk about some background, some context, we're going to pray and we're going to get out. They're like, yes, I'm on fire, I'm going to do all this. I wanted to show up for the last five weeks, I just couldn't. So that shows me your commitment. But this came up. That's fine. It shows me your commitment. And I'm not saying everybody needs to be at the Bible study on Tuesday. I'm just saying sometimes you need to speak the truth in love. I would love for you to be there. I would love for you to be as committed as you want to be committed. But you just don't have margin in your life right now. And because you don't have margin, 
you don't have room for any of these things. So when you have room, when you created margin, come back. I would love to spend some more time with you. But right now, I'm taking time away from my family and my job and my activities to pour into you, and you're not coming ready to receive. And it's that tough conversation you've got to have sometimes. You've got to speak the truth in love. See, see people want to come, and I, I know people who, like, we want to see the kingdom grow, right? One, one of the, you know, the catch, catch terms for this is revival. We want to see revival. We want to see revival in the church. And people are praying for revival, actively praying and pleading with God for revival, but we're not using our gifts. God, can you come and do something supernaturally that you've gifted all of us to be able to make happen on our own, but we're not going to do it. We don't want to put in the hard work, right? Why in the world would God show up and do something supernaturally that he has gifted all of us to help do? The church in America is, I mean, it is, it is crashing so quickly right now. The amount of ministers who are no longer getting in ministry and the few percentage that are, are actually retiring from ministry, there's such an insignificant amount. The church is so different from COVID. Just a few years ago, the average number, the average church size back then was like 115. Now it's 73. It's like big things are happening. Why? Because we expect Bible colleges to show up. Somebody else has got to be producing, right? I don't see a Bible college or a seminary anywhere in Scripture. I see you're supposed to grab people, teach them what they know. We're supposed to give them opportunities to use their gifts, coach them up so they get a little bit better. And once you realize that all of us have these gifts and all of us have these talents and abilities, then things begin to go. So, so here's what I hope. Here's what I hope. I hope that uh, I've actually already started talking and having conversations that this year you'll see more than me and Richie preach. There are some of you sitting in chairs, maybe a couple of you because we can't move fast. That'll be up here preaching. And in, next year you'll be better and the following year you'll be better and the following year you'll be better. And other churches will say, we don't have a pastor anymore and we can't afford him because we don't have enough people in the church. And we'll say, I know somebody can come over there and preach for you. West shouldn't be leading worship 52 weeks a year. It's not healthy for you, besides healthy for him and his voice and all of the above. It's just not how God made us to be. We've got to recognize this. And those of you who, who believe you are spiritually mature, the, the non-spiritually mature people love to serve exactly where their gifts are. The spiritually mature people say, no one likes to take out the trash, I got that. No one likes to wash the dishes. I got that, right? I mean, think about you around your house. If you're a parent, you get this. The church is a body. It's the same thing. We all need to recognize that the gifts that God has given to all of us belong to all of us. Stop being selfish with your gifts. We know that the kids' ministry needs more volunteers. It does in every church across the United States. It's not all that fun. For me, some people are gifted and they absolutely love it. Some people are like, I guess I could, but I'm not going to. And you're going to go tell Amy and Holly, I would like to be able to help you out. And I think people would be great. It's just not me. That's pretty bold. Man. What has God gifted you to do? How does that match up with your spiritual maturity level? Because when those two start combining and we start seeing these gifts show up and, and we get out of the way and start empowering you to use this, the kingdom's going to grow. Revival's going to show up because God has given us the tools, the abilities, the infrastructure to do this. We've just got to decide it's important enough to do. So this week, I want you to spend some time quietly. I want you to do an evaluation on your, where am I actually spiritually as compared to where I think I am? What gifts do I really have? And maybe they're not in the list on 1 Corinthians or Romans. Maybe it's a different list and you're like, I got to figure out how to use this gift. Yeah. Or you can come to us and maybe, maybe we've got an idea. 
But God wants special things from his body. That's why he has given us special gifts. He has given us the infrastructure. He has put a team together to do miraculous things. We just need to take the opportunities he gives us. And I hope that this week we take those opportunities.